Have you ever had a topic that you, uh, that you knew so well or that you were so confident in that you said there's simply no reason to discuss this anymore? Set in stone, no reason to discuss it. Yeah, some of you do. Okay. It is going to happen. It's, it's done. No reason to discuss it. And then all of a sudden, somebody drops a truth bomb in your lap, and all of a sudden, it explodes, and you're like, wait a second, I never thought of it from that angle, from that perspective. And all of a sudden, that which you thought was surely correct, now you're saying, wait a second, maybe I don't quite have it right. Or maybe there's at least something I need to think about a little bit more. That ever happened to you? I'm a reader, okay? If you come to my office, you'll find books, okay? Lots of books. I read lots of books. I think reading is a great thing. I'm a big proponent of reading. I'm a big proponent of literacy. I think it's very important. Most of my children like to read. I have one that doesn't like to read. I don't think he's my son. <laughs> he knows who he is. Um, it's strange to me. It's strange to me for people not to like to read. I like it. I think it's, I've, I've read my, every, I cried before I went to school, and my mother asked me, she said, Stacy, she says, why are you crying? She said, I, st I told her, I said, what if I'm never able to read? She says, you'll figure it out. Whew. She's right, I figured it out, so that was good. Um, since this is something which I believe in so strongly, reading and literacy is so strong, it is something which I think it is so foundational, so important, that the idea of reading being a bad thing, how could that be? But do you know that there were people once upon a time that advocated the idea that reading was bad? That's true. Once upon a time, there were people who said this idea of reading is a horrible idea. It ruins people's education. Well, how could that be? Let me give you the rationale. They throw this bomb into my lap. They say this. People who read are dependent upon books. They don't have to use their minds. An intelligent person memorizes great epic poems and great passages and great speeches and great works. What are they doing if they go and they find books and have to look things up and to reference things? They are stuck and enslaved to the written word. What a strange way of thinking. But in their mind, the idea of memorization and building memorization was much more important than reading. Doesn't that sound strange to you? Huh. Kids these days, they don't memorize phone numbers anymore. They look them up on their phones. They don't know anybody's phone number. Kids these days, they don't know how to use a map. All they do is Google search it, and they find the map, and they use that. They don't know anything. They put it in their GPS. They have no idea what they're doing. Isn't that the same argument? Oh. Oh. Do you know that I still know my friend from kindergarten? His name is Mark. I won't give his last name. I know his house number to this day. 509-924, I'll stop there so you don't call. I don't know if his parents still live there or not, but I know his house number. I do. Because I memorized it. Hmm. Oftentimes we have this idea that we, we, we get these concepts and we say, this, I'm so certain of it, I'm so sure of this that there's no longer any discussion. Reading is good and there should be no discussion. Well, there, once upon a time there were people who said, it's not that grave an idea. I had never thought of it from that perspective. Interesting. Huh. If you're Jewish, if you're Jewish, there are certain things that you believe and there's no further discussion. One of the things that you know is that you know that God has established a priesthood and God has established a priesthood with Aaron and Aaron has, from Aaron come the Levites and with this group of individuals, the priesthood is set and this is what glorifies God and this is how we have an interaction with God through the priesthood of Aaron or the priesthood of the Levites. This is set in stone. It's in the law. There's no further discussion. Nobody even needs to talk about it. It's done. Check. Right? If you're Jewish, this is what you believe. This is correct thinking. And then the author of Hebrews says, oh, <laughs> I have a truth bomb for you. 
I'm going to give you something which is going to fundamentally make you think and rethink what you think you know. I want you to come this morning. I want you to come to Hebrews chapter 7. As we come to Hebrews chapter 7, what we find here is we find our author is going to challenge, challenge the thinking that the everyday Jewish person would have. And he's going to challenge it with some very, very obscure sections of Scripture. He's going to do it and so that it's like, I, I, I never saw that. As a matter of fact, he has teased it out already a couple of different times. We've already seen that there is a name, a name out there called Melchizedek, and we have seen it in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 10, and then we saw it at the very end of chapter 6. And so he's teased it out there a couple of different times, and now finally, finally he's going to open it up and say, hey, now I'm going to discuss the guy. To which we're saying, good, about time although it's a complicated and a little bit of a difficult passage. Surprise, surprise, Hebrews has a difficult passage, I know. All right, but we come to Hebrews chapter 7, and in Hebrews chapter 7, what we're going to see, once again, is our author will fundamentally challenge the Jewish way of thinking about the priesthood. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 1. Oops, I'm still in 1 Corinthians. Okay, Hebrews chapter 7. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High... God, Most High God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And to him Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything. And I'll we'll stop right there. Melchizedek, what do we know about this guy? Do you know that Melchizedek is only mentioned twice in the whole Old Testament? Twice. He gets four verses. Four verses about Melchizedek. That's it. Since it's brief, we'll turn there. Go to Genesis chapter 14. In Genesis chapter 14, we see the historical account. Now, just last week, we had our author of Hebrews. He brought in Abraham, a longer section about Abraham, right? He talked about the faith of Abraham. We like Abraham. Abraham's a good guy. Abraham is faithful. Abraham does what he's supposed to do. Abraham goes to the point of almost sacrificing Isaac, as God had asked him to do. When we come to, so we like Abraham, now as we come into uh, Genesis chapter 14, we see Abraham and Melchizedek. So uh, he, Genesis chapter 14, we'll pick it up in verse 18. Three verses here. And Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God Most High. And he blessed and said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, he has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything, and Melchizedek, gone. That's it. That's it. Gone. That's not a whole lot. He didn't pay, evidently, his, you know, his press agent enough money. He does not get a whole lot. Now, when does this take place? This takes place in the book of Genesis, time of Abraham, obviously, which means this takes place well before Moses and well before the giving of the law in the wilderness, correct? We need to understand that this is important. This is pre-law. This means this is pre-Aaron. This means this is pre-Levi. This means it's before the established priesthood, which we see in Old Testament law, correct? Yeah, that's what it is. This guy drops into the scene we get three verses, and then poof, he is gone. That's it. That's it. If I were to make a message based upon him and only spoke on Melchizedek out of Genesis 14, and this is all the information I'd have, you'd say, Stace, you got nothing. There's not a whole lot there. And quite frankly, there's not. Okay? Except for, we get one other verse. Go to the Psalms. I want you to go to Psalm 110. We come to Psalm 110. He's mentioned in verse 4, but we will read the verses which precede it just to give it a little bit of flavor, a little bit of context. This is a Psalm of David. The Lord said to my Lord, that is, Yahweh, the covenantal name of God, said to my Lord. David is speaking here. So he is saying, Yahweh says to my Lord. Okay? 
Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter, rule in the midst of your enemies. Okay? We have here that the Lord is talking about a kingly type of rule. Okay? Verse 3, your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments from the womb of the morning. The dew of your youth will be yours. Verse 4, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever under the order of who? Melchizedek. Congratulations, you have just read all of the Melchizedekian passages in the Old Testament. Four verses. That's it. That's it. That's the whole thing? Yeah. If you're, if you're an Old Testament, if you're Jewish and you're, you're, you're thinking about the Aaronic priesthood, you're thinking about the Levites, in no way are you thinking about Melchizedek. He is somebody who you don't even contemplate. But our author says, ah, there's more here than you think. Come back to Hebrews. So we come back to Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 7. In Hebrews chapter 7, what we'll see here is we'll see uh, a, re a restating of what we've almost, uh, basically of everything we've already read. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And to him, Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything. He is first, translation, he is first by translation of his name, king of righteousness, and then he is also king of Salem, that is, king of peace. So we ask ourselves, who is this guy? First of all, he comes out and he blesses Abram or Abraham. Okay? We'll leave that alone for a second. We see, second of all, we see that Abraham will give 10% of what he has to Melchizedek. We'll leave that alone for right now. We look at the translation of his name. His name is Melchizedek, okay? Okay? Or Melchi Tzedek, okay? Melech is king, Tzedek is righteousness, okay? That's Hebrew 101. So Melech and Tzedek. He is the king of righteousness. That's what it means by the translation of his name. And we are also told that he is the king of Salem. Salem is like uh, Salam, like Shalom. It is peace. He's the king of peace. Okay? Great. So that's what we have here. So that's what we know about this guy. What's the significance of this? It shows us that he's a, a good guy by name and also because he is honored by Abraham. Great. Let's move on. Next first. He is, and this is the weird part, he is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. How did he get that from four verses in the Old Testament, right? What is he talking about? He doesn't have a father and a mother. What is he talking about? He doesn't have a genealogy. What, what's, what's the point in all of this, right? Right? Anybody got any good ideas? Huh? Even with Jesus, we know who Jesus' mother is, do we not? Mary. Okay? And Jesus is conceived by the Holy Spirit, so we could say, well, we know, you know the, the male side, if you will, where that part came from. Is this guy some sort of, you know, early era test tube baby? Right? What does it mean, no mother and no father? There are some people that say, well, no mother, no father. Maybe that means that this is a pre-incarnate manifestation of Jesus. No, I, I don't know if that really works for me. I, matter of fact, I don't think that works at all. Matter of fact, if, this, if that was the case, you would think that the author of Hebrews would say, oh, by the way, Jesus was there beforehand. No. Seems like that's reading the New Testament back into the Old Testament. I don't think that works. I think the simple answer is this. He has neither father nor mother nor genealogy. What he's saying here is that the father is not known, the mother is not known, and his genealogy is not known. Well, why is that important? Because genealogy means everything to a priest. You can't be a priest unless you can trace back your genealogy. You can't. What we have here is we have an individual who is very mysterious, who only gets four verses. Only four verses in the Old Testament. We know almost nothing about him. We don't know who his mother is. We don't know who his father is. We don't know his genealogy, but here he is, and he has shown up. 
Okay, you're saying, okay, well, that's, that, that, that's all very interesting. But what does that mean to me? He is without father, without mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life. He's like, well, is he eternal? No, it's just we don't know when he was born and we don't know when he died because we don't see that. We get another descriptor, but resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. That is, like the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. That is, we don't see his end. In a literary sense, he has no beginning and he has no end. The priesthood of Melchizedek, therefore, continues. We don't see an end to it. So you're looking at this and you say, okay, okay, okay. Um, what's the punchline here? Let's get, get, get to the point. Where, where's the, the truth bomb, if you will? Okay, great. Go, go to verse 4. See how great this man was to whom Abraham, the patriarch, gave a tenth of his spoils. So we'll work in sort of a backwards order now. Let's look at what Abraham gave. Abraham gave 10% to Melchizedek. Notice the further description of Abraham. Abraham, the patriarch. You probably should underline that, put some highlighter on it, put an exclamation next to it. Abraham, the patriarch, gave 10% to Melchizedek. Abraham, our father, Abraham, who was so important in all of our history, Abraham, who was the example of faith, Abraham, which we already talked about in the previous chapter, who almost sacrificed his son, who was the model of faith for us, that Abraham gave this guy Melchizedek? A guy who only gets four verses, gave him 10%? Who is this Melchizedek? Who is this? Hmm. Continue on. And those descendants of Levi who received the priestly office have a commandment in the law to take tithes from the people, that is, from their brothers. Though, uh, though these be, excuse me, though these also are descended from Abraham. He says, listen, in the Old Testament law, the priests, the Levites, they get 10%. That's how it goes. But they didn't get 10% from Abraham. Abraham gives 10% to somebody else. Verse 6, but this man who does not have his descent from them receives tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. Remember, Abraham is a man who is blessed. God says, I'm going to make a great nation of you. I'm going to make a great people out of you. I'm going to give you this type of land. You have all of these promises. It's this Abraham who is blessing, who is being blessed by Melchizedek. And so let's look at the blessing. He says, it is beyond dispute that the inferior, that is Abraham, is blessed by the superior, that is Melchizedek. Understand what our author is doing here. You are saying that the relationship which you have with God goes through the priesthood, goes through the priesthood of Levi, it goes through the priesthood of Aaron. It goes, that's how, how it works. And what this guy is writing here, he is saying, that's something you take for granted. I'm here to blow it up. I'm here to tell you that Melchizedek is superior, so much more superior that the one who is the ultimate example of faith for you, Abraham, gave money to him. And he, that same guy, Melchizedek, blessed Abraham because Abraham was the inferior to him. Wow. Wow. All right, let's read on, read on a little bit more. Verse 8. In the one case, tithes are received by mortal men, but in the other case, by one of whom it is testified that he lives. That is, your everyday priest dies. There's a succession plan. With Melchizedek, we have no recording, once again, of his death. Therefore, his priesthood is open-ended. There it is, in that literary sense. Hmm. The point of all of this, well, let's, let's read on one more verse here, or two more verses. One might even say that Levi himself, now you say, now who's Levi again? Okay, so you have Abraham and you have Isaac, right? Isaac had two sons, Jacob and Esau, correct? And then Jacob had 12 sons and a daughter, correct? One of the 12 sons is Levi, correct? There it is. 
So you have Levi, and from Levi, eventually we will get Aaron. And so we have the Levitical priesthood or the Aaronic priesthood, okay, as described in the Old Testament law. So what he's saying here, he's saying one might even say that Levi, that is the great-grandson of Abraham, Levi himself, who receives tithes, he receives tithes from his brothers, paid tithes through Abraham, for he was still in the loins of his ancestors when Melchizedek met him. What he is saying here is that the great-great-grandson is tied to his grandfather, and when the grandfather gave tithes to Melchizedek, it was as if Levi had done that himself. There's a connection there. All of this is to say one major point. Abraham and Levi, Aaron, all of the Levites, they are inferior to Melchizedek. If you're thinking, if you're a Jewish person and our author is writing to you and you're thinking, you know what, times are tough. I have social pressure to go back to the old ways, to go back to temple worship. I have social pressures to go back and to, to stay within the synagogue. I have social pressures to try to reunite with my family who has cast me out. I have social pressure uh, to just to go ahead and, be, and belong. I have persecution against me because people have taken my, my property from me. And I'm looking forward, not looking forward to, but I expect I will be physically persecuted. If you're saying to yourself, it might just be best to go back to the old ways, what our author is saying, he says, nonsense. The old ways have everything to do with the Levitical priesthood, and the priesthood which is superior is that which is based in Melchizedek. To which you're still saying, why is Melchizedek so important? Why is he so important? Here's why. Melchizedek is important because he, he is the one who will prefigure Christ, and it is Christ who will be in that same type of priesthood. Look at verse 11. Now, if perfection had been attainable through Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek, rather than one after the order of Aaron? You know what? If, if everything could have been right under the Levitical priesthood, then why in the world do you have to have another priesthood? You don't. You don't. Just do things better and you're fine. His point is this, is that there is another priesthood. Now, keep in mind here, if you're Jewish, you're saying, listen, we don't have to worry about Melchizedek. Melchizedek was all the way back in Genesis chapter 14. And historically, God, yeah, sure, Abraham mysteriously gave 10% to Melchizedek, somebody which we don't really understand very well. He only gets three verses in Genesis chapter 14. But what we do know is that God gave us the, the, the law and the, and the descendants of Aaron, the Levites, they're the, going to be the priests, and whatever is written in the law supersedes Melchizedek. So, sure, Melchizedek may have been a priest of some sort, but along comes the law, and the law supersedes it, and so we're good. That's the Jewish thinking, Right? It has been superseded. Here's the problem with that. Psalm 1104. Psalm 1104. Go back to that and let's read it. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. It is true that Genesis 14 is written before the law, that is, before the, uh, the setting up of the priesthood. It's true. But it is also true that this particular passage is written about 400 years after that. If they are making the argument that the Levitical priesthood supersedes Melchizedek, the same argument can be made here from Psalm 110, and that Psalm 110.4, that the oath and the declaration of God here in Psalm 110.4 supersedes their priesthood. Therefore, the Melchizedekian priesthood is the first 
and it is also the latest and the greatest. You cannot find perfection. You cannot find perfect union with God through the Levitical priesthood. You can only do it through a different type of priesthood. And that different type of priesthood is prefigured with Melchizedek, and we find it ultimately in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is not a priest or high priest that follows the Levitical line. He is a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Now come back to Hebrews chapter 7. We'll look at a few more things here as we finish up. Now, perfection had been attained through the, Levit through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law. What further need would there be, excuse me, for what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek? Because one did, according to Psalm 110, rather than one named after the order of Aaron. For when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. For the one of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe, from which no one has ever served at the altar. Did you ever think about that for a moment? How is it that Jesus could be the high priest like Aaron when Jesus comes from the wrong tribe? Jesus isn't a Levite. He's not. Look at verse 12. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah. And in connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. In Psalm 110, and I read you the, the first three verses, not just four, we see here a messianic psalm, which is talking about one who would come who would have the scepter. When Jacob blesses his sons and he blesses Judah, he says, and the scepter will never leave you. We know that the kingly line comes through Judah. We see that same thing in Psalm 110, verses 1 through 3, but then there's the addition in verse 4, and that the king will also be the priest. And so we have a king priest out of the line of Judah. It is not possible out of the line of Levi. If you're Jewish, you're saying, well, our interaction with God has to come through the tribe of Levi and has to come through Aaron. No. Wrong. Everything that you thought you had right, matter of fact, it was beyond discussion, gone. And yet, there are still within you, some of you are saying, let's go back to the old ways and let's go back to the Levitical priesthood and let's keep the sacrifices and let's go back to the temple and let's celebrate with our families and let's keep all of the feasts and let's do... Gone gone. Jesus is the king priest. There is no going back. There is no going back. Going back is to go back to a broken system, a system which has truly been replaced. If you were to follow Christ, if you decided to make a decision to follow him, follow him. But count the cost. Think about it ahead of time. Jesus warns his disciples, he warns the people as a whole, that it is, it is imperative that before you decide to follow Christ, that you better count the costs. In Luke chapter 14 and verse 25, now great crowds accompanied him and he turned and he said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. That, by the way, doesn't mean that you're supposed to hate your mother and father and your wife and your husband, but in comparative to your relationship to Jesus, he comes first and they come second. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not sit first down and count the cost, whether he, is, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to encounter another king in war will sit down first and delib deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. And if not, while the other is yet to a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. 
We need to understand that when we choose to follow Christ, we choose to follow Christ. There is no going back. And that's the problem with these folks here. There is the temptation, the social temptation. There is the persecution that is upon them. Turn around, turn back, turn back, turn back. That system's done. Jesus represents a different priesthood. He does. Perhaps you're here and you say, you know, following Christ is... <laughs> has caused me all kinds of inconvenience. It's caused me inconvenience. I, I don't get promoted as much. I don't get make as much money. I, I don't, maybe don't have as much fun. I can't live in immorality. I, I can't have as much license, you know. I don't have the security I once had, you know. I hope you've counted the cost ahead of time. Holding on to Jesus is the best thing that you have. There is no going back. We have the perspective of history, we get to look back as well. Hebrews, I believe, is written well before the fall of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem does fall in AD 70. Think for a moment of the person who said, well, I'm going to follow Christ, and, ah, and they kind of waffle, and they want to go back to the old way. In AD 70, there will be no going back. Josephus, the Jewish historian, writes this, while the temple was ablaze because the Romans have come, and the Romans are burning it down. While the temple was ablaze, the attackers plundered it, and, and countless people who were caught by them were slaughtered. There was no pity for age, no regard was, regard, was recorded. Rank, children and old, laymen and priests alike were butchered. Every class was pursued and crushed in the grip of war, whether they cried out for mercy or offered resistance. Through the roar of the flames streaming far and wide and the groans of falling victims were heard, such was the height of the hill and the magnitude of the blazing pile that the entire city seemed to be ablaze, and the noise, nothing more deafening and frightening could be imagined. There were cries, there was a war cry of the Roman legions as they swept outside in mass, the yells of the rebels encircled by fire and sword, the panic of the people, cut off above, fled into the arms of the enemy and their shrieks as they met their fate. The cries in the hill blended with those of the multitudes in the city below, and not many people who were exhausted and tongue-tied as a result of hunger, when they beheld the temple on fire, found strength once more to lament and wail. Perea and the surrounding hills added their echoes and the deafening, to the deafening din, but more horrifying than the din was the suffering. The temple mount everywhere enveloped in flames seemed to be boiling over from its base, yet the blood seemed more abundant in the flames and the number of the slain greater than those of the slayers. The soldiers climbed over the heaps of bodies as they chased the fugitives. There's no going back. In AD 70, in one sense, God gives a great mercy in the sense that he lets the temple be destroyed to show them that there is no going back. Jesus is the one which you must hold on to. Jesus is the one who is our great high priest, not from Aaron, but from Melchizedek. For Melchizedek supersedes Aaron. It is a different type of priesthood, one which continues on. Literally, in a literary sense and in a literal sense, our Christ will reign. Anyway, as we come to Hebrews chapter 7, a complicated section, a hard section for us, and most people are like, oh, I didn't understand a whole lot about this, because he only gets four verses in the Old Testament, and yet our author makes a big deal about him. Next week, we get him a little bit more as well, so we learn a little bit more. But what an amazing thing it is, and I think you need to hold on to this, Christ is worth holding on to. Don't go back. Don't go back.